This new MicroTik switch has 20 2.5 gig Ethernet ports. It also has four combo ports and two QSFP plus 40 gig Ethernet ports. This has a ton of other features, but of course, because it's a MicroTik switch, there are definitely some quirky things to it, and we're gonna get into those in our review. So let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and this might be one of the craziest little switches that MicroTik has produced in a long time. And if you're looking at this thinking, eh, this doesn't look that crazy, hold on a sec, because uh, we're gonna do a little flip here, and uh, there's this giant heat sink. You might think that's because it's a fanless switch, but you'd be wrong because it's more like a fanless adjacent switch. To say that we have a lot to go over in the MicroTik CRS 3264C plus 20G plus 2Q plus RM would be an understatement because there is definitely a lot here. I know a lot of our YouTube audience and a lot of our readers on the STH main site have seen a lot of these small two and a half gig ethernet switches that we've reviewed, but they're always asking for bigger ones. We actually just did another MicroTik switch review that was two and a half gig switch and people just said like, hey, I want more. And well, this is certainly more. It is 100% not perfect. And we're gonna get into why in a little bit, but if you do want something smaller than this and you haven't seen it yet, we have an ultimate two and a half gig ethernet switch guide that you can find on the STH main site. As I'm recording this video, there's somewhere between 35 and 40 switches on that, but there are gonna be over 50 by the end of March. And since this is an embargo date review, I do wanna point out that Microtech did send us this switch, but they don't get any input into our editorial process. They just send us a product and we can do a review if we want. But if you've been watching the STH YouTube channel for a while, you know we've done a ton of these switch reviews. And I do wanna say a quick thank you to all of the STH YouTube members who have joined the channel down below and have helped us go and buy all of the optics, DACs, and stuff like that that we use to go and test these switches. So thank you to all those members. And if you do wanna join, you can find that down below. With that though, Let's get to the hardware. Okay, so looking at this switch, the first thing you're gonna notice is that it is a one U chassis. I don't have the rack ears on here right now, but uh, you know, there's little rack ears that go on the sides. Now, one of the really cool things is that this is a two and a half gig switch. So you're gonna see the first 20 ports here are two and a half gig ethernet ports. I am so excited for the fact that MicroTik has actually jumped on the two and a half gig ethernet bandwagon and we're starting to get switches based on that. That is awesome. There are some things I'd like to change, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now you may have just heard me say that there are 20 two and a half gig ethernet ports, but then you might be looking at this and saying, wait a sec, I see three blocks of eight ports, which is 24 ports. So what the heck is going on here? So the last four ports and the four SFP plus ports are common which means that you can plug something into one or the other, but not both simultaneously. Now, this is really cool because it gives you a couple of options. One, you can continue to put your two and a half gig ethernet and just kind of like plug those into the extra ports and sure you have those. You can also use SFP plus modules and use optics or DACs or whatever in the SFP plus ports instead. Or you could also use 10 G base T adapters and this switch will run at 10 G base T speeds, but only if you put it into the SFP plus port it won't do 10G base T if you put it into the other side. Hopefully this makes a little more sense than when we first uploaded this video. Now, since this is a CRS 326, that means that we have of course 26 ports, which we have 20 two and a half gig, we have four 10 gig, and that means that we need two more. And those are the QSFP plus ports. Now these QSFP plus ports are 40 gigabit ethernet ports. So on one side of the switch, we have a couple vents. And then uh, on the other side of the switch, we have a couple vents and you're gonna notice that, you know, these are just, uh, this is kind of like just a place for the rack ears over here. But on this side, we have a hole for a fan. There is no fan on the inside of this. You'll see that in a sec, but uh, it might look like that this is gonna be a fan chassis because when you get to the back of it, it has this giant heat sink. There's uh, many rows, there's like five rows or six rows of fin fins here. Uh, this is kind of a crazy, it's pretty darn heavy, I'm not gonna lie. But what you do also get on the back here is another vent and you get these two power inputs. This does have a redundant power input and this little uh, bracket or this little wire here is there so you can go and put a power cable in here and then you lock it in place using this wire and that allows you to have a more secure connection. Now, something about these power supplies, these are internal power supplies, they are not external power supplies. And frankly, that means that you can't go and swap them out. So if one fails, so you're using the redundant power supply, but you don't get to like hot swap it like you do on some of Microtik's other switches. Of course, they're trying to hit a lower cost point. And so I think that's the reason for that. Other features are of course that it is a cloud switch on the top, even though it's a cloud router 
reserve switch or CRS in the product name. And of course, flipping it over, we have the bottom of the switch, which really doesn't have that much. We put the little rubber feet that came with the switch on it. And we also have a label. Microtik devices have started to come with a randomized password. And so you have a login that's a little bit more secure than the old one. And that's something that is just required for many regulations. And so Microtik, like all the other IT vendors have had to go change to something like this. But with that, let's get inside to see how this is made. Okay, so getting inside the switch, there's only five screws that hold it in place. So it actually comes, the top comes off of this pretty fast. And I really like the fact that Microtik makes it relatively easy to get inside their hardware. And so let's take a little tour of what's inside this. Okay, so obviously what we need to talk about is this heat sink. This heat sink is huge. It goes all the way, uh, extends past the back of the chassis to so get these little fins. And then inside the chassis, it's pretty large in there as well. You can see over here that this is where the chassis ends in the back. And it definitely goes, you know, well into, well past the back and then also goes uh, into the chassis. So kind of an interesting heat sink design. It's kind of like somebody at, at Microtech just said like, hey, we're going to go put a giant hunk of metal in this. It's going to be cool. We have seen other designs like this, and this is probably one of the fancier heat sinks designs we've seen for Microtech. Now I have a theory on what that unpopulated fan spot was. I actually think that Microtech designed this switch to have a fan pull air through the heat sink inside the switch and exhaust it out of this little port over here. But then in the shipping version that they sent us, this fan wasn't populated, so maybe they just found out they didn't need it. It looks like you can just add a fan here, but of course, that's just speculation and my best guess. Now, the other thing that we see is you're going to see that we have these heat pipes, and these heat pipes go to like the FIs for the you know 10G base T and two and a half gig Ethernet connections and like all that kind of cool, awesome. Uh, but the other thing that I go to is the switch chip, which you're going to see kind of like in the middle of this chassis, and that's where the Morvell switch chip is. Now, in terms of CPU, we have a QCA 95. 31, which is a 650 megahertz single core MIPS processor. It's definitely not the fastest, also not an ARM processor, which we've seen on a lot of other Microtik switches. In case you're wondering, we are now on DDR5 in servers and workstations, but this is a DDR2 solution. Okay, now let's talk about this side of the chassis. Now you're going to see that we have these two kind of like yellow and black cables, and those are going from each of the power supplies to the motherboard. So there are two redundant power inputs. Now under this big black thing over here, we have two redundant power supplies and that's what gives us really that redundancy and that's why we have our two power inputs and inside the chassis you're also going to see something that's kind of fun which is that we have two fans but these fans are not just kind of sitting on the chassis and mounted out here and just uh, blowing fan you know blowing air directly out instead they're kind of like angled and they're just kind of moving air uh, kind of towards this general direction of the case and we've definitely seen these kind of like angled fans in other systems we've seen Dell systems and others with angled fans like this so it's not like weird in any way it's just something that's, I guess, maybe a little bit quirky for a switch like this. Now, I know there are probably a number of folks that are looking at this and thinking like, hey, is this a PoE switch? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. We don't really have the power the stuff that we would see for like, you know, PoE on these ports. So kind of a bummer. Hopefully they come up with something like that in the future and uh, we'll see. With this, you're probably wondering what's the performance of the switch? Uh, also, you know, what, what about the power consumption and noise of the switch? So we'll, let's get over to the other set and talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about the power consumption and the noise of the switch. And overall, it's pretty good. However, when you first go and plug those power supplies in, you're gonna hear the fan spin up and you're gonna, you're just gonna be like, what the heck is going on? The power consumption won't be that high. You'll see power consumption maybe 13 to 20 watts or something like that, but the noise is gonna go well into the 50 to 60 dBA range. It's gonna be loud. Those two fans are just pumping air. But once the switch boots and the fans start to spin down, you know, we have the system or the switch right now at idle. The switch is sitting, I think somewhere in that like 31 watt range, plus or minus a little bit. And in our 34 and a half DBA noise floor studio, the noise floor is gonna be raised to only about maybe 35, 36 DBA. So I can, if I think about it, I can definitely hear it, but it's definitely not too loud. And it would be super annoying if it was like under a desk or something like that. I think you'd be totally okay with that. Now, of course, as you plug devices in, the power consumption goes up because the interfaces are lit up. And there, you know, Microtik says that the most that you can do with all the attachments is somewhere around 51 watts. The maximum power consumption that it's rated for is around 70 watts, but we didn't really get much over 50 watts, I don't think. So overall, from a power budgeting standpoint, I think you could say 
from about 31 watts to about 51 watts is probably the range that most folks are going to see. It's not going to be a crazy you know, power switch by any means. Now, I do want to point out that if you've seen some of our other switch reviews, you're going to hear like 30 watts. And you're like, what the heck? That's so much. But just remember that this is a much higher end switch chip. We have things like 40 gig network interfaces. We also have the combo ports. And so by having so much connectivity and a higher port count switch and all that kind of stuff, you have to use a higher end switch chip. That higher end switch chip, of course, has higher end features. And that all just means that we have more power consumption. A lot of the lower cost switches that we are seeing, they are using just fine switches, but a lot of them are actually using like real tech switches that were made for like the automotive industry that are being repurposed. Of course, they'll pass traffic no problem because they have to in cars but on the other hand uh, you know this is kind of more of like a network switch base with that Marvell Prestera in there and hey while we have it up why don't we talk about the management of the switch now the overall management of the switch I think is awesome especially for like the SMB market I know there are a lot of different markets all over the world that use these switches or micro tick switches but I think that you know this has something that a lot of the other switches that we've reviewed just frankly don't have so first off let's talk about this which we have behind us which is Winbox and Winbox is a cool application that will scan the network, tell you what the MicroTik devices are on there, and allow you to connect either by IP or by MAC address. We actually have this system or this whole thing set up with a system there, and it's connected via a MAC address, which is kind of cool if you are worried about conflicts on your network or something like that. You can actually go in and configure the switch just by hitting the MAC address rather than by hitting the IP address. And for a lot of folks, that would be very difficult to do uh, if you didn't have a tool like this. So I really like the fact that Winbox gives you this option. Now, of course, one of the cool things is that, you know, this has a lot more features than you get in a normal kind of low end switch. We have things like WireGuard, you're gonna see MPLS, you're gonna see all kinds of stuff here. And while you can use these features, I just wanna point out real quick that if it's not a hardware offload function that's on that Marvell switch chip, the path for that data is it has to go like, you know, in a port, it goes goes, hits the switch chip, it then goes over to the management processor, which is our 650 megahertz processor connected with a one gigabit pipe back from that management processor to the switch. Just frankly, you're not going to get two and a half gig ethernet or two and a half gigabit speeds on this. You're not getting 10 gigabit and you're certainly not getting 40 gigabit speeds if you have to go hit that management processor. Remember, you're maximum one gigabit to that. But on the other hand, it is a good way to learn and just kind of see how Microtik does stuff because they do have other boxes. And if you do want to go and play with those features and actually deploy them, them for real, that would be something that you know, you'd probably look into not really using the switch to do it. Now, I mentioned that we're using Winbox here, but there's also a web GUI. So you can go to WebFig and you can see something that is frankly very close to what you see on Winbox. And then the other thing, you'll actually see that we have it over here, which is that there is a CLI that's available for these. We have both that serial console port. And we also have this out of band stuff so we can go and SSH into this and go manage it that way. And frankly, I think that this management suite that Microtik has is just a lot better than some of the lower end switches. This of course costs a lot more, so it's in a different tier, but on the other hand, I think that a lot of folks are going to appreciate the management features of the switch. You know, with that, why don't we get to our key lessons learned? Now, with all of these videos, I like to have a key lessons learned section. I mean, we've reviewed switches for years, but even just on two and a half gig Ethernet switches, we've now reviewed dozens of switches, and we have something like 50 that between you know what we've actually published and what's actually uh, you know we've actually tested. We, we've done a ton of switches. So, what do we learn with this one? To me. I think that this is an interesting switch because it offers more two and a half gig ethernet ports than the last MicroTik switch that we looked at. And I frankly understand why a lot of folks like the cheaper and lower port count switches. They make a lot of sense for a lot of folks, but for folks that maybe want something that's a little bit larger of a switch, maybe there are folks that also just want to have something from a brand that they've heard of before that's been around for a long time. And frankly, I know that there are a lot of folks that have a decent number of client devices, but also have a not a huge number of systems in their cluster. And if you're still using 10 gig ethernet, whether that's 10 G based T or SFP plus based networking, or if you want to use the 40 gig networking or split that out into four 10 gigs, whatever it is, um, you know, this switch has quite a bit of connectivity. I think for a lot of folks, this is all that they'll need, or maybe like a second one for redundancy, right? At the same time, the entire time that we reviewed the switch, 
All I kept thinking was about the 10 and 40 gig. I get the fact that it's inexpensive. I get the fact that many systems these days now come with 10 gigabit ethernet. We just reviewed a QNAP NAS that has 10 GBase T networking. We reviewed a little minis forum MS01 system, and that's a little mini PC that has SFP plus networking. So I totally get the idea of having combo ports. At the same time though, I really wish that this had a 100 gig or 25 gig port infrastructure so it could uplink to some of the other higher end switches that Microtik has. Now I fully get that the challenge with that is if you move up to a higher speed switch, you're gonna end up paying more, which makes the switch cost more, but I just can't shake the feeling that I want something like that and maybe we'll get it if there's ever like a 48 port version of this. For my last key lesson learned, I wanna talk about pricing. So we did our entire review and then we finally got pricing just before this is gonna go live at launch. And uh, we we're told that the MSRP on this switch is gonna be $999. Now that is expensive. I do wanna point out though that most switches that Microtik has tend to sell over time for less than their MSRP. For example, there's a Microtik CRS 510, which essentially is this 504, but two of the ports, instead of being 100 gig, are 425 gigs. And that switch also sells for $999, but the street price on it is like $880. Still at $880, this is not necessarily a cheap switch, especially for one that's 170 gigabits per second of total combined, you know, that's what our ports are. And then also um, it doesn't have 25 gig ethernet. And let me just give you a couple of data points to back this up a little bit. So this is the Microtik CRS504. We did a video on that. Of course, we're gonna link that in the description, but this has four 100 gig ports. So it has a total of 400 gigabits per second switching capacity and the switch itself is street price somewhere in that maybe 650 to 700 dollar range now of course you have fewer interfaces but it's still a lot cheaper when you're getting more than twice the switching performance out of it now 100 you could say hey this is a different class of switch because it has you know 100 gig ethernet it's only four ports so it doesn't have like all the wild io and all the you know different interfaces that this switch has i totally get it guys but let's take a look real quick at this qnap switch now this QNAP switch is a really interesting one. There's both a managed and unmanaged version of it. The unmanaged version I think sells for about, I don't know, it was like 550 bucks. The managed version is usually like 650 to $700 depending on the day and it's like street price. Um, and, and just kind of what this is, is it does have a web management interface, all that kind of stuff. It has eight 10 gig ports and eight 10 gig SFP plus ports. So you get 10, you get 160 gigabits worth of, you know, ports. And, uh, you know, just to me, that's pretty interesting, right? Because that kind of gives you a lot of options. Like you could take some of these SFP plus ports, put them into lower cost switches. And then all of a sudden, you know, if you really need some two and a half gig ethernet, you could totally go do that. You could also put it into like PoE switches, like the ones we've reviewed. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of options there. Um, if you want to go put, you know, two and a half gig ethernet and still come in at a lower price than this switch. So to me, this is the kind of switch that if it were maybe under $800, I would say like, okay, that makes a lot of sense for the switch. But at $999, it kind of feels like it may be a little bit too much for a switch like this from Microtik. At the same time, street pricing is almost always lower in Microtik land, especially after the initial batches come out. So I would say stay tuned for that. The one feature that I wish this had though, was I wish that there was like a PoE++ option or something like that in here. It just kind of feels like this would be a killer switch if it had some PoE features, but often Microtik releases PoE versions after they release the non-PoE version, so we can always pray for that, I guess. Overall though, this switch has a kind of cool mix of ports on it, has management, however the heck you wanna go do that. A decent number of features, redundant power supplies, and it's not too, too loud, although it is not necessarily silent. So I definitely think I like this switch. I just think that folks are gonna have to take a look at the price of the switch, what you get, and then also is that the right price point and uh, feature set for you in the market? I think for a lot of folks, it is gonna be. For other folks, they're gonna be like, well, I really only need like eight ports, so maybe there are other options out there for me. And of course, if you do wanna look at other options, we have that ultimate guide that we'll link in the description. That's gonna be an important resource because we are continuously updating that. I mean, everyone more and more switches are on there. And by putting everything in one place, it kind of makes it easy that if you need more or less of one type of port or whatever, you can go find that there. But of course, those key lessons learned are really my thoughts, the thoughts of our team. They're not necessarily the only thoughts out there. So I'd love to hear what you guys have to say down in the comments. And hey, if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on this notification so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.